Um, now, what I'm going to talk about today is a survey of the ontology of mathematics. And I'm going to go through this very quickly uh, and spend, uh, so I'll, I'll go through the main options in the ontology of mathematics very quickly. And then I'm going to spend a little bit more time describing the option that Jobst and I are developing, which is not uh, completely original, but it's original as applied to mathematics. Um, it's also original in the sense that it's still new, which means that we haven't, by any means, identified all the weak points. Uh, and e even the, the phrasing, uh, in other words, the terminological choices that we want to make in order to make our view clear, uh, they're still uh, somewhat uncertain. But that's partly because we can say some things very clearly in German, but the translations into English are not acceptable because they sound very old-fashioned and we don't want to sound old-fashioned. They don't sound so old-fashioned in German, but anyway, but, but you'll see uh, some of that as we proceed. And um, so the ontology of mathematics has to address these two questions. So what is the mode of being and what are they? And both questions are addressed to mathematical entities, which are things like numbers, geometrical shapes, groups, Hilbert spaces, uh, equations, and um, perhaps many more. And we've done a lot of thinking at the very general level about how these categories relate to categories in physics and also to categories in BFO. But it's a very much at the general level, so we haven't yet worked out all the details for all the subtypes of mathematical entities, such as abelian groups and imaginary numbers and real numbers and so forth. Now, uh, very, very summarily, I've distinguished five standard accounts of the mode of being of mathematical entities. And uh, not all of these accounts have actual uh, defenders, but they are positions which do have defenders in other areas which are in some ways like mathematics. And one of the goals of this uh, talk is to illustrate some areas what, which are in important respects like mathematics, because we're going to choose one of those areas and steal the account of mode of being and apply it to mathematics to get the uh, ultimate account that Jobst and I want to defend. So the first is the error theory. Maybe no one defends this. The error theory said that <laughs> to believe that there are mathematical entities is just a mistake. Now, we can use mathematical symbols to do all kinds of wonderful things, but those symbols don't refer to anything. And those who think that they refer to, to, uh, to something are just making a mistake. Now, this mistake is a very useful mistake to make, but it's a mistake. And, um, and then secondly, uh, a, a related theory in the sense that it doesn't really give uh, credence to the idea that there are mathem mathematical entities is logicism. Now, logicism is not about anything. Lo sorry, logic is not about anything. Uh, to say that if P, then P or Q is not about anything, but it is a, a, a valid rule of logic. Now, what logicism says is that mathematics is a branch of logic. And therefore, mathematics doesn't say anything. It's not about anything. It gives you certain kinds of rules of inference. And we'll say a little bit about that, but we're not going to take it very far. That is the most mature view of mathematics um, and the, the, the most thoroughly developed. But unfortunately, it, it was also shown to be uh, not workable at, at different levels. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Now, another view, and again, I'm not sure this has ever had any defenders in mathematics, but has had defenders in other areas like ethics. It might be called anything that satisfies ism. And the idea here <laughs> is that if you have a, a complicated theory about ethics, for instance, but you don't know what norms or values or um, good or evil are, then you just present your theory as a collection of axioms, and you say anything that satisfies these axioms is a norm or is a value. I don't know what those things are, and I don't care, because I have my axioms. And that, that, that is a whole program in philosophy called the Canberra program, 
because it was invented and I think it's still defended by some people in Canberra. Um, and then Platonism, uh, this, is, this is probably the oldest but not the most well-developed theory, uh, says that there is a whole realm of mathematical entities which are abstract or atemporal outside our purview. They're not part of the empirical world. And um, uh, mathematics is about those entities. So mathematicians stare up into this platonic heaven and they decide how to write their axioms. And you do see some mathematicians staring up when they work. Um, the big problem with this is that we have to explain how it can be that truths about abstract entities in some transcendent realm could be so useful when doing physics, for instance. And that's the big problem in the, onto in the philosophy of mathematics, namely, how do we explain the applicability of mathematics? Now, the final view, and our view will be a sub-view under this heading, although yours hates the idea that we might be social constructionists. <laughs> Um, we are good social constructionists. <laughs> Final view says that mathematical entities are social constructions. And I will give you some examples of so bad social constructionism, and then I hope you will be convinced that there is also good social constructionism, and then we will uh, argue that mathematics is one example. Yes? Okay, I think there is another option, uh, that is the fictionalism. So, oh, yes, you're right. right. Actually, it was on my list, but it, somehow I deleted it. Yeah, fictionalism. It's a bit like the error theory. Fictionalism says that mathematical entities are like fictional entities. In fact, my very first publication uh, defends a view like that, um, but in a good way. All right, so fictionalism is, um, whenever I use Zoom in the university, the internet breaks down. Um, so in order to... Um, you can just close. In order to avoid the consequences of that, I'm going to record in the real world rather than in the Zoom world. I'm recording if you want. Uh, you could record it. You are recording. Okay, I will record it anyway. Just for um. Okay, now. Are there any other questions while we're waiting? So far? No, we can't, we can't get some. Although I do have an internet connection, that's great. All right. Oh, um, Mary, Mary. Yes. Uh, can you say fiction is a kind of social construction? Uh, no, because there's nothing constructive. So the idea behind, oh, well, yeah, I, I guess so. I guess so, but that's not, that, that's not going to be an important uh, uh, question. All right. Now, so uh, logicism, as I say, says mathematics is a branch of logic, and so if you could express all the theorems and axioms or all the theories of mathematics in logical terms, then in principle you ought to be able to deduce all of those theorems or all of those axioms from the axioms of logic. Frege and Russell both believed that this was possible, and they both presented uh, their accounts of how you could indeed infer large bodies of mathematics from logic. Uh, in Frege's case, Russell showed that Frege's axioms were inconsistent and created Russell's paradox. Um, which uh, he created it just before uh, Frege's main work was about to go to press. <laughs> and so Frege was able to add a, a paragraph at the beginning forward in which he said um, uh, that, that um, Mr. Russell has 
suggested to me that there is some problem, but I believe that this problem can be addressed if you just add this extra wrinkle to some axiom. And that extra wrinkle did indeed work, but only in a universe which had exactly one object, or, or some crazy restriction like that. And so Bertrand Russell then published his own version, along with Whitehead. Um, and um, uh, he did a, a, a much better job in the sense that he was at least, as far as we can tell, consistent. But the, the job that he did was very, very complicated. And um, it was useful uh, in the further development of logicism within the realm of set theory. But it was more complicated than the useful versions of that theory. So the useful versions of logicism say that not that all mathematics is a branch of logic, but that all mathematics can be expressed using set theory, the axioms of set theory. And, um, and set theory is not uh, is, is somewhat more powerful than logic as we standardly understand it, and also set theory has problems of its own. Yes? Uh, but I know recently there's uh, some chain called the new Bergerism. So some guys may yeah, have that follows just yeah. fix the problem. Yeah, yeah. And these things come, come back. Come and go. But, so. All right. Anything that satisfies this, and we've already <laughs> mentioned, I've mentioned uh, the, the Whitehead and Russell them, them work in three volumes. It's called Principia Mathematica. It's an amazing piece of work, but as I say, it became outmoded. Um, a logicism we talked about. Now, the, the next bit that is, is taken from a talk I gave 20, maybe more years ago. Hence the, the really old-fashioned design of my um, uh, slides compared to the new ones, which are much more modern. Um, I deleted all the, uh, the, the animations, which are. Um, and this is just an extract, a few slides from this old talk, because economics is one area where social constructionism would seem to be a reasonable choice. But Austrian economics adds a very important um, dimension to social constructionism, uh, which I will try to explain very quickly. And then later on, we'll see the relevance to mathematics. So Karl Menger was the founder of the Austrian School of Economics. He, um, he founded a school, some members of which were associated with <coughs> Austrian philosophers, such as Brentano. And so I, I published a book on the Austrian School of Philosophy, which contained treatments of Austrian economics. I also published several papers on Austrian economics. And um, a, a, the, 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 the two um, running threads which join together the Austrian economists and the Austrian philosophers are an, a, a, a kind of reverence for Aristotle uh, on the one hand, and then a belief in a priorism on the other hand. And I will explain the a priorism um, in due course. Uh, now, Menger had a reference for Aristotle in some of his terminology. He also he, he had a reverence for things which were not Aristotelian in other parts of his writings. So Menger is not a simple proponent of any kind of Aristotelian approach. Um, now, what is economics for the Austrian school? So the economic domain, domain includes things like buying and selling, uh, valuing, and pricing, putting a price on something, and negotiating, and many other things. Uh, and if you take the state into account, then it includes things like taxing, and, and <coughs> you include banks in the account, and it includes things like interest rates, loan, loans, and so forth. So there are lots of constituent parts of the economic domain. And the Austrian school says, well, let's work out what are the necessary dependence relations so in order for something to have a price, does it have to have a value? Well, I don't know, but in order for something to have a value, the Austrians would say, it has to be such that someone values it. So there have to be things like preferences. So we have a dependence relation between value and preference, or between value and wanting. Now this is a very simple example of what we're going to be calling an a priori law. And what that means is that it's not a matter of logic, 
it's not, um, uh, in other words, it's not purely empty. There is some content, some real content there. And um, it's something which is intelligible. Anybody who understands what value is in the economic realm and what wanting or preferring is in the economic realm can see that value requires wanting or preferring. This is called subjectivism. In the Austrian school, the idea is that things have value only to the degree that the subjects in the relevant society will, are willing to pay or are willing to barter in order to own those things. And there are many other such a priori dependence relations in the, doc, in the uh, doctrine of the Austrian school, which become very, very sophisticated and have all kinds of implications. Um, and I've given another one here. You can't have an exchange without having an exchanger and an exchange. You can't have a buying without having a selling, and you can't have a selling without having a buying. These are, there are lots and lots of relations like this. Now, some of them may be analytic in the sense that they are just a matter of definition. But you see, it can't, if we take buying and selling, it can't be that both buying and selling are uh, definable in such a way that it becomes analytic that buying requires selling and selling requires a buyer buying. You have to start either with buying or with selling. You can, you can define selling in terms of buying, but then you have to accept buying uh, and, and the, the features of buying as being something which is not analytic. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, hmm? So, and this is a, an example of the kind of analysis that Menger created. So, uh, for him, a, a good exists only if there is a need. And he, a good implies value, and value um, exists only if there is some kind of a need. Whether this be a basic need or whether it's a need of the moment, for instance, when you see that some film is playing in a cinema and you you feel a need to go and see that film. That's, that's not a basic need, but it is a need in the sense of manga. Uh, a basic need would be the need for food or something. Um, and now, uh, the, the object has to be such that you can <coughs> satisfy that need. It, there has to be knowledge. So goods exist only where there is knowledge. Knowledge of needs and knowledge of causal connections. And not necessarily on your part, they could be causal connections on the part of the seller. Sorry, not, they, they could be knowledge on the part of the seller. And uh, a, co a command over the thing, so you, you, you have the money to buy it. So somebody has a copy to sell. Now, um, this a priorism as the Austrian school is defended in Menga, but it's defended in a more radical way in Mises, Ludwig von Mises, who was uh, a famous Austrian economist of the first half of the 20th century, uh, with a large school of followers. And um, he says, uh, and he was influenced by Kant, which may explain why he gets things wrong. Um, he said that there is only one axiom, and that all the other axioms of economics follow from this one axiom. And the axiom is man and act. This is the axiom of action. If we understand action, he says, then we understand need, value, and all the other things analytically. They, they all follow from this one axiom. And then uh, two of his followers, um, uh, one, uh, Murray Rothbard. Um, so Rothbard, in fact, reviewed the book that I wrote on the Austrian School very friendlyly. And uh, Hermann Hoppe, Hoppe, uh, he's a German, uh, which I, is not necessarily a bad thing, um, <laughs> who uh, wrote a very nice book, which I like, Defending Sovereignty. Uh, it's called something like The, the, the Mistake in Which is Democracy. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I, I like the, uh, some of the thinking of Hopper. All right. Now, now, so we've already mentioned... Um, many of the terms that we're going to need. Uh, so if something is analytic, it's, if it's a truth of logic, and it, we're talking about truths or propositions or judgments or statements. Uh, a, a truth is synthetic if it adds to your knowledge. It's not, it's not analytic, in other words. Uh, truth is a priori if it's known independently of experience, which means it's 
intrinsically intelligible in some way. And uh, a posteriori just means not known by it. Uh, it means known by experience. And that is Kant. <laughs> I can't use use. You could have picked a better photo. Um, Where did you get that photo? You could have picked a better photo for sure. <laughs> Absolutely, the idea. But he must have looked like. I mean, there are better pictures of. As an a priori. <laughs> um, so can poor guy. Kant's theory of the synthetic a priori, but he thought that it only held for physics. We have. To dedicate prior eye knowledge about time, space, and causality, and that knowledge is called Newtonian mechanics. He thought we knew that a priori, and maybe he's right, but the, the point I'm going to be making in what follows is that there are many, many other areas which are such that we have a priori knowledge, seemingly, which Kant did not address. Um, so, Kant may have got some aspects of the synthetic a priori right, but he certainly didn't get the scope right. All right, so I just said that. Um, now, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about Mises or Menger. These are just um, uh, illustrations. This is more important. So this shows the Aristotelian uh, basis of Menger's views. And general essence and general connection, they are the two key components of our view of uh, mathematics and physics, actually, when we get to it. Um, so in German, that would be Wesen and Wesenszusammenhang. And now, general essence and, general, and the general connection of economic phenomena uh, they sound okay in a sentence like this, but if you, tr if you try and write about general essences in a paper published in an analytic philosophy journal, which is the only philosoph type of philosophical journal which the we're matters. publishing in, uh, then <laughs> people will just turn up their noses and say this is something old-fashioned. So that's our problem. So we would like to call the synthetic a priori truths, which we are studying, basic zusammenhängen. In other words, general connections of essences, but we can't, because it's German. So why not stick with the synthetic a priori truth? Is true? Because that, we're not talking about truth anymore. We're talking about things on the side of the mathematical or realm of physics. Can't you so call them postulates instead of truths? No, that's the same problem. So postulates are on the side of truths. Yeah. We want to talk about what is on the side of objects. We want to say that there are essences and essential connections on the side of the objects in themselves, or objects themselves, I should say. Uh, and that this is so in mathematics, as well as in physics. In mathematics, it's, if anything, even more obviously the case, but in mathematics, the tendency to see things as being analytic is very strong because of logicism. Yeah. All right? Um, so, this is another word for it, non-inductive intelligible structures. Now, we know that every human is born virtually with the capabilities to apprehend, recognize non-inductive intelligible structures. Differences between colors, for instance, can't be learned. Differences between shapes can't be learned. Distances between feeling good and feeling bad can't be learned. Uh, they, they, you grasp those things in, innately. They are in, intrinsically intelligent. And as we get older, more and more of these intrinsically intelligible structures become um, evident to us, as well as, as a result of the fact that we also learn a lot of them. Okay, this is Adolf Reiner, um, who has a much more, much straighter face than Kant. <laughs> um, he was a philosopher of law, who was also a student of Husserl. And in 1913, he published a, a book length man monograph on, it's called The A Priori Foundations of the Civil Law. And it's that which is our model for mathematics. We want to uh, do the ontology of mathematics based on this Reinachian approach. And um, I'm going to, I have a lot of slides now about Reinach, but I'll go through them very quickly, so don't, don't be disturbed by the fact that I'm going through them very quickly because we don't need them. Um, let me say a little bit more about Reinach, just for interest's sake. Um, so, 
Reinach was sometimes referred to by Husserl's followers. So Reinach was a follower of Husserl. Husserl founded a school, but there was a group of Husserl's followers in Munich. And Husserl was in Göttingen and then in Freiburg. He was not in Munich. So the Munich School of Phenomenology is a, a kind of separate wing. And uh, they, they were accused by Husserl of practicing what he later on, when he became critical of some of the Munich school work, of practicing picture book phenomenology. And what that means is they would take a domain like aesthetics or chemistry or ethics or the will, and they would draw phenomenological pictures, uh, diagrams effectively, although they didn't use diagrams, but they were thinking in a way which you could capture very well diagrammatically. That's why I like them, incidentally. Um, I like diagrammatic uh, representations of philosophical views. That's why I became an ontologist, I imagine. Um, so Reinach was uh, almost certainly the, um, the cleverest of these people, and he was referred to by other people later on even when he moved to Göttingen uh, to be in, in the same town as the same university as well. He was referred to as the phenomenologist's phenomenologist because you should go to him if you wanted to know about phenomenology, not to Husserl. He was a much better teacher. Now, another person who was in Göttingen is, is, is Edith Stein. Uh, and I assume you all know who Edith Stein is. Edith Stein. So she it was Husserl's last... She, uh, she was Husserl's assistant during this period. Uh, she helped uh, Husserl write at least one of his books. Um, Husserl uh, obviously couldn't give her a job because she was a woman, um, but uh, she was Jewish, but she converted to Christianity, uh, but she was sent to a con concentration camp, and her, her life was a, a, a kind of model of, of singleness, and so after she died, they made her a saint. So the Munich school had at least one saint as a member. But actually, it had two, because another member of the Muni School, who was also a friend of Edith Stein's and Reinhardt, so their, their, their correspondence has been published, was a Polish philosopher called Roman Ingarten, who applied the, the Munich phenomenological method to works of art, literature, architecture, music, and so forth, among other things. And one of Ingarten's friends, uh, in Poland, when he went back to Poland, uh, was became the Pope, uh, the Polish Pope, who was now a saint. And the Polish Pope was a professor of philosophy, and he was uh, he was uh, focusing on Thomas Aquinas and Max Scheler. And Max Scheler is another member of the Munich School who applied the phenomenological method in his case to everything under the sun from aristocracy to war to the greatness of Germany and the impoverishedness of uh, grocery in England and so on. So Scheler was fantastically uh, all-encompassing, but his book on ethics is also fantastic. All right, so this work, like the speech act theory of Austin and Stirl, starts out with a promise. So the promise is a, a phenomenon which we're all familiar with and which is obeying a priori laws, just like buying and selling. In fact, it's, it's related to buying and selling because there are some promised aspects involved in many economic transactions. Contracts are promises. Uh, and now, the, the, this, this is a, a very good source book about Reiner and uh, the whole Munich school. Okay, I'll come back to Reinach in a minute. Let me just talk about social constructionism. First of all, it's, a, it's a, a big, bad, ugly vegetable garden with different kinds of views. And a very illustrative account of this big, bad vegetable garden is by Ian Hacking. It's called The Social Construction of What? And some of the examples he, he deals with in that book are facts, gender, quarks, madness, reality, and so on. So the idea that madness is socially constructed would turn on the fact that particular terms like hysteria, which were very common in the Victorian times, but which are now completely not used, 
would suggest that the, what those particular terms referred to were, was and were social constructs. That's the kind of idea, always a historical idea in hacking, that hacking uses to uh, characterize, identify social constructions. Um, all right, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ingarden because this will give us a clue to um, uh, the, the complexity that can be found on the side of socially constructed entities. Now, now, the whole world of works of art is clearly socially constructed. And there, are, there are clearly different tastes at different times in the history of art which make certain things appear beautiful to one generation that would not necessarily appear beautiful to another generation. Now, Ingarden's approach to unpacking the ontological structure of a work of art is in terms of what he calls strata. So, a work of art for Ingarden has strata which we uh, need to apprehend in order to apprehend the work as a whole, but we apprehend them as a unity. And so, that this is a work of literature, we have phonetic formations. In other words, when we read a poem or a novel, then we read in such a way that we read the words as being spoken with a given alliteration, a given accent. Um, and um, for instance, if we read a, a novel in which there is a German or a Russian character, we may hear the German or the Russian accent. Um, but in any case, there are sounds afoot in, in the literary work. If you don't have any sound associations when you read a work, then you're not getting the full body of the work as an aesthetic object. Then there are meanings, simple meanings and complex meanings of all the sentences and paragraphs and so on. Then there are what Ingarden calls schematized aspects. So we are presented with the hero as having long black hair, but we're not presented, we don't know how long and we don't know whether it's genuinely black or whether it's dyed. So that it's schematized aspects. That means that we don't know everything. We only know certain things, a finite number of things about the, the places and people and actions presented in the work. And then there are those places and people and actions and states of affairs which are presented in the work, and they form a, a, a stratum in and of themselves. And then in some cases there will be value qualities and metaphysical qualities which are associated with the work, which you apprehend when you read it. And now, um, the Ingarten has a very complicated account of what it is to read a literary work. Um, and the, what the work is depends also upon the readings that take place. And, uh, and so he has a theory of the literary work of art as being a product of human intentions. Now that's a kind of social construction. So if you just throw a lot of ink on paper and it comes out with words, to be, be words, by whatever means, but no, it's never sold, it's never given to anybody as a novel, then it does not exist as a literary work. A literary work exists only if there is a readership. Now it may be that no one reads it anymore, but still it exists because there was once a readership. Um, so it's a, it's a social construction because the readership is a social entity. And the author is relatively insignificant. Uh, so the author doesn't decide what the meanings are or what the schematized aspects are. I accept in, insofar as he gives all the clues that you can ever get when he writes the novel. It's the readers who make those decisions. And clearly they'll be guided by what the author says and they will share lots of assumptions that the author shares, but they may also have different assumptions. All right, so uh, an example, well, no, I won't give an example. Now, music is, has only two aspects, or in some, some cases only one, so we're talking now about, not, not about opera, but about symphonies, so one second. And, um, some works of music have value qualities, they have a kind of metaphysical um, quality about them, but basically what, what uh, music is characterized by, and here is an error, is not by word sounds, as it says here, but by sound. So 
of a work of music is a sound formation. Big one. Uh, yes, Carmelo. Are readers or audiences co-agent? Um, it comes down to that, yes. Um, it's just the, the it's not uh, simul it's not um, a symmetry. So the uh, basically, Ingarden has a view according to which the, the work of art has a life. It's born when the author pushes the manuscript on the publisher's desk, or a bit later than that, and it dies when the planet is annihilated or everyone stops reading it. Um, and during that time, the readers determine what the significance, the meaning, the sounds even. So Shakespeare. Um, we hear now, if it's performed today, maybe in a kind of old-fashioned English, but still it's English, where in Shakespeare's day, sh the, the accent that people spoke in England was a combination of York, what is today Yorkshire and Danish. And that's quite different from what, the way we hear Shakespeare now, and that means that Shakespeare's plays have, in their life, evolved to be different today from what they were. Um, in the olden days, them are created. And the examples come from set theory. The best example of autonomous ma mathematical objects, I say, are the numbers. And um, so the, the German mathematician Kronecker had a saying which is, has been repeated many times God made the natural numbers, all the rest is the work of man. So I'm defending the Kronecker. Something like the chronic theory. And then the second paper I published was on the same topic, actually. I was already boring. Um, so I just went into more details about the historical aspect of uh, mathematics. Although I didn't really say any of the things that Jobs and I want to say now about the history of mathematics. Uh, because I was working with a rather narrowly constrained phenomenological framework. I was working to find a way of applying Ingarden ideas to mathematical entities. And then the third paper I will mention, uh, all of this is within the 1970s. These were the, the I, I think this was not the third paper I published, but um, um, the, this, is, this paper is about this relation, the relation between representations on the one hand and the real world now. And uh, so there is this picture. Um, it was really published. They didn't force me to make a real uh, print quality graphic, unfortunately. Um, so that's the real world down there. And the real world, of course, includes consciousness. Um, and the, the graphic doesn't even capture that very well. And because there is consciousness, there are all kinds of targets of intentionality. Now. Some of these targets of intentionality, which are in the inner suburbs, if you like, might exist. So, for instance, uh, um, the snow smoking zone in a restaurant, that's socially constructed, but it really exists. Poland really exists. That's socially constructed. Um, and, but some of the things in the outer suburbs are dependent for their ontological status exclusively upon consciousness. And examples would be uh, fictional characters. And now the question is where mathematics goes. And, and in the earlier papers, I had an argument for the, the role of the two kinds of mathematical uh, entities. Um, but this is about all the different kinds of entities that we can be t directed towards in our mental experience. Some of them are autonomous. Some of them are intentional. But they really exist, like Poland. And some of them are purely intentional. So they can be targets, but they don't exist in any sense, such as Hamlet in, in the play, or better, Sherlock Holmes in the novel. And now, this is a slightly richer diagram. So we have, uh, it's a better diagram. So the inner sub suburbs now are counted as part of the real world, but there's the parts of it here are still dependent upon consciousness. And these are intentional, so the rocks and the planets are, in, are autonomous, but everything above the line is intentional. And 
the outer suburbs then are fictional. Basically. Now, um, how many people have heard of intuitionism as a philosophy of mathematics? A couple of you, three. So intuitionism is one of the tr classic uh, positions that people developed in the philosophy of mathematics. After the failure of Frege, people wanted a more grounded foundation for mathematics. They wanted to have certainty. And Frege thought he had certainty, but the whole thing plopped. Um, and Frege is fantastic. Uh, his contributions are fantastic, but his account of logicism was a failure, and uh, therefore his account of mathematics was a failure. Brouwer and Heiting developed their own peculiar way of uh, sh shoring up the safety of mathematical claims. And the way it said, we can only believe in mathematical objects if we've constructed them in a construction. And a construction is a kind of proof. Um, so you can construct numbers by counting to them. There were some extreme followers of this kind of view who said that since we can't count to, let's say, 600 billion, 600 billion is already infinite. They were called finitists. And the, the, the leader of the finitist movement is now dead, I assume. This was called Yesenin Volker. And maybe there were another, no other members of this. But anyway, Brouwer and Heiting were much, much better than finitism. So they developed a, a version of the calculus on intuitionistic lines. And the main way of understanding intuitionism is to point out that it implies that we cannot believe in the law of excluded middle anymore. So the law of excluded middle says that if you've proved that not P, then you can, you, you can infer that P. And that fails for intuitionism because you might have a constructed proof that not P but no constructive proof of P. And you can only assert P when you have a constructive proof. And this is a very interesting idea. Um, and I, I, so some of you will know that I studied with Michael Dummett in Oxford. And I attended a whole uh, term's worth of lectures by Dummett on the intuitionistic calculus, which is a very I mean, it's like doing calculus with one hand tied behind your back. But you learn a lot uh, if you have to do calculus without using the law of excluded Now, but it died, basically. There are very few people who um, believe in intuitionism as a movement anymore. But it became a settled part of what you might call the lattice of mathematical options. And if you, were, if you regard a a mathematical theory as a, well, no, if you re so I say lattice, I could say Boolean algebra, let's suppose we have each math approach to mathematics sees mathematics as a Boole Boolean algebra, then you can see the intuitionistic mathematics as a special kind of Boolean algebra, a weaker Boolean algebra, and to be precise, it's a relatively pseudo-complemented pseudo-Boolean algebra. Pseudo-complemented means that if you know A and you know not A, then you don't know that you've filled the whole space of options. That's not quite right. But anyway, I, <laughs> okay. um, I won't say any more. You can work it out for yourself. All right, so this paper I published, uh, this is Kronika. Uh, my, my example were Cantor's set theory and then there are transfinite cardinals. So Cantor's set theory is a theory of sets. It works very well for finite sets. People showed that it works very well for infinite sets. But now you, you get a, a, a lot of freedom in creating more and more types of really, really big infinite sets. And clearly, uh, there are different paths you can take in building bigger and bigger infinite sets. And it seemed to me intuitive that some of those parts might be leading to truth, but at least some of them, and you could make a fake one if necessary, at least some of them are not leading to truth. There are no 
transfinite cardinals of this sort, for instance. Um, just a, a very messy sort. But one clue whether a particular branch of set theory is useful, or is real, it's about real things, is whether it's useful. And some transfinite set theories are useful for physics or in some other number theory. And so they probably are about real mathematical sets. But some of them are not useful, and they might be good candidates for being fictional. So they, it's beautiful fictional mathematics. Uh, all right, now the next um, topic we have to deal with uh, is structuralism. So if we want to say that pi is a socially constructed entity, we still have to say what kind of entity it is. Um, here, the, 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 the Platonist view is still embraced by many people, including by many mathematicians, consciously or not. But another view which is embraced explicitly in a number of very influential publications is structuralism. And that this says that mathematical entities are structures. And the locus classicus for this view, which is also the first paper I read in the philosophy of mathematics uh, when I started studying philosophy of mathematics in Oxford, is that by a man called Benassarath, this is a classic of the philosophy of mathematics. And his idea is you take uh, Russell's theory of what numbers are, and you take, I think this is Cantor's theory of what numbers are, and um, so three is the set consisting of zero, one, and two, and, and so forth, and you get two logically incompatible accounts of what numbers are, both of which have perfectly good mm -hmm. application, there's no, no difference in the degree to which they're useful. There are many other accounts of what numbers are, you can generate your own theory. And so Benastraf concluded that numbers are none of these things. Rather, we have a certain structure, which we could call the number structure. And this number structure is exemplified here and there and in all of the other various candidate accounts of what numbers are. So numbers are nodes in structures. And they are probably themselves structures. Everything is a structure from the point of view of structuralism. Now, we, Jobs and I, embrace uh, structuralism, but we, we do not hold that all of mathematics are structures. We think that would be, um, yeah, that would be turtles all the way down. And, and um, so we want to have some basis, uh, some Wesen, some essence, upon which the Wesen zusammenhänge, the combinations of Wesen, which are represented standardly in set theoretical terms, could rest. And so our resting place are going to be 0, 1, uh, and maybe the line or the point, or, and, and, and various other unitary things, so non-structures, which will be the basic elements of which the out of which the structures are built. So we're not classical structuralists, we are structuralists with bottom. Um, all right, um, now. I think Noah has a question. Yes. So are natural numbers then doing the grounding? No, just zero and one, because once you've got zero and one, you can get all the others, basically by adding one. And adding one again. So okay. so zero and one, and what else? Well, we don't know. We, we, we for almost certainly will never know everything about what constitutes the bottom. Um, Jobs, I know, thinks that you can do it with just zero and one, but I'm fighting. Wait, why, why wouldn't you be able to? I, I, I just have this feeling in my brain. <laughs> you know, how do we get the circle? Well, I mean, what is stopping us? Is there any errors that we face when we just go um, down to zero and well, one? We need to be able to construct the circle. Uh, and I, it's hard to see how you do that from zero and one. Yes? Can we it's say ambi side is a circle of structure? A what? Ambi side. Uh, is ambi side a structure? I can't hear it. Empty set a structure. Empty set. Yeah, yeah. that might. That, uh, I, when when Jorg yeah. talks about these things, he identify zero, empty set, and the null operator. Mm -hmm. Things are all the same. And he, he, then he has one, the set, um, 
which contains the empty set as, as its only member, and the uh, the, the progressive operation. Yeah, you had it on a different side, yeah. Um, yes? If zero and one are, where, where, if they're doing the grounding, where do they exist? Um, so, that's a very good question. Um, I would, where does pi exist? So zero and one are going to have to be created, I'm afraid. They're going to have to be socially constructed. So there are two kinds of math mathematical entities. Those which are socially constructed ab initio, in other words, as part of the ground, and those which are socially constructed with the help of one or other um, uh, structural uh, combinatory uh, um, relations. And, and part of our ontology of mathematics includes structure generating relations like set of. And um, the, the idea, the historical idea would be that they discover pi and then they discover, um, uh, or roughly at the same time, they discover all of the geometrical relations that you can construct with compass and, uh, and ruler. Um, and and uh, but first they discover how to construct those things, but they didn't do it in the right order. So they discovered pi before they knew of anything about irrational numbers or about sets. But if you reimagine the history of mathematics so that things are discovered in the right order, then you get a, a chain from the very very simple mathematics to the more complicated, and then our basic theory says that the principal driver in creating more and more complicated mathematics is physics. So as physics develops, engineering develops, the people's I I inventions develop, they need more and more complicated mathematics. That forces the development of more and more complicated forms of mathematics and thereby mathematics then continues to develop. And that's what's happened since about Galileo's time. I mean, isn't worried that it's a structure but then an apocalyptic event where yep. enough of us die and yep. the only remaining people are like the Amazonian tribes and do you really want to say those numbers are out of existence? Yeah, so um, I'm afraid I don't have any choice. <laughs> Because I don't want like, to say it, but I don't have any. Because it seems like, you know, like what are the chances of aliens being born? Somebody could imagine a future civilization that could start. Yeah, so as long as there are records left. I mean, we, we can wipe out the sort of record, too. Like, this is start from the ground. Like, can you imagine another planet away from here that has a. Yeah, so that, that, that is a problem. So let, let's, let's go through your uh, possible scenarios. So, one scenario is that all records and all civilization is destroyed on Earth. But uh, there are tribes who survived, and they, after a few generations, they recreate mathematics. But they do it differently, in whatever way. Maybe they do it inconsistently with what we uh, did, but maybe they repeat. So they invent pi. Is it the same mathematical entity, or is it a different one? I, if you're a Platonist, the answer to that question is easy. If you're a social constructionist, it's hard. Um, and I don't have time to one social. of those questions for which I have no answer. Um, and now, exactly the same ca case would be if on Mars, they did, the Martians developed their own mathematics, which happened to discover part. Would it be the same? Um, the temptation is to say it would be the same, but that's because Platonism is always the temptation. <laughs> yes? Uh, so, is it not necessary that uh, I will be discovered? No, it's not necessary at all. Um, and for, for many thousands of years of existence of human beings, they didn't discover time. It took time. We see it as being rather trivial, but it wasn't quite complicated to reach that point. It's complicated to reach the point where you could recognize that a, the, a hypotenuse on a right angle triangle is not necessarily going to be a measurable in a real, with a real number. Yep. So now zero, one, pi are constructed. Uh, no, zero and one are gra gra ground stones, they're foundation stones. Pi is constructed. Wait, they're ground stones, but didn't we also create it? Yes. Okay. Wait, we have to lay the foundations okay. ourselves. Yeah. So create it. Yeah. Okay, but 
but the uh, a priori laws were not constructed? So the, um, once we create certain uh, mathematical entities, then certain intelligible truths um, are forced upon us, as it were. It's not that we create them, it's that we, they're forced upon us. Um, and now, this is always complicated, and the time, uh, the things didn't happen in the right order, but the people who invented pi knew very well, as a matter of a priori truth, that pi is the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of the circle, because that's how they discovered it, that's what it was meant to be, so that's almost one of the But um, then they discovered various other relations involving pi, and they, they proved to themselves using the Euclidean methods that those relations hold um, universally for all circles. And um, uh, that, that means that they had more a priori truths, and a priori knowledge about power as, as the geometry, geometric understanding developed. So we don't make synthetic a priori truths. We discover them after we've made the objects which they're about. And this, this, when I get to the law, this will become clearer. Anyone? All right, so the, the, the structuralist <laughs> that I recommend you read is Scott Sh <laughs> Stu Shapiro in Ohio. Um, there is a Stu Shapiro in Buffalo. That's where I uh, have to make clear which Stu Shapiro I'm referring to. Um, so um, I think he's right about the first uh, two, but that he's wrong uh, when he says just. Him, it, it is structures all the way. All right, so now we're going to develop Reinachian structuralism. And we're going to start off where Reinach started, which is in the ontology of law. And as I said, he invented in 1913 much of the act, but it is simultaneously a speech act. So it's not that you have a mental act which you could formulate in words mental act which is formulated in words and in the case of the promise it has to be formulated in words vis-a-vis -vis the promisee so the promisee has to register that you have made a promise otherwise you haven't made a promise and um, all of that is a priori synthetic a priori and Reinhardt recognized that Searle and Austin had glimpses of that, but they didn't. Um, they didn't have. They, they didn't want to to embrace the doctrine that there are synthetic a priori truths, and indeed synthetic a priori structures, which is what Reinach is all about. Reinach is about the synthetic a priori structures realized in these sorts of cases, and also in many other sorts of cases which go to form the law. And. Um, so Searle developed a whole ontology of social reality which he, he expressed in terms of the collective imposition of function. So this is a president, uh, which is a physical thing, but we imposed upon the president the function of ruling the country. That was a collective imposition of function. And for Searle, that is the theory of everything in social reality. It's always a matter of collective imposition of function. And so we can do it on objects. So we can do it with cathedrals, we can do it with driver's licenses, we can do it with dollar bills, and this is all captured in, in this slogan or uh, formula. So a, cathedral, a, a building counts as a cathedral in context C if there is a bishop and, and so forth. Um, so this human being counts as a president because we have to collectively impose function upon this. And, and this doesn't work, so I am one of the few people who showed Searle that he was wrong. So he printed a correction. Uh, it doesn't work as a general theory of social entities because uh, a debt is a social entity. But there is nothing upon which you, we collectively impose a function. If you, write the, if you write IOU on such and such, then the debt note is fitting with Searle. Uh, formula. But if I just say I promise to give uh, um, Ali a hundred dollars tomorrow, I should let's say eighteen thousand dollars a year in six months. Which is not uh, actually completely empty. 
Um, I signed paperwork, or I will be signing paperwork to United States soon, which is the other person who has to release the money has not signed yet. Um, so I just promised to Ali, but and therefore I have an obligation to Ali. But my obligation is not a piece of reality, a piece of stone or plastic or uh, organic material upon which I impose the function. So Searle is wrong, and he abandoned this formula. He said he never meant it seriously, it's just a meant it. Uh, but he abandoned this formula because of what I call freestanding Y terms. So X counts as Y. There are some X's which are social entities for which there is no Y. Uh, sorry, Y counts as X, so there are some entities in the social world, some Y's, which are not such that there is an X of grounding upon which they rest. So they are freestanding Y terms which are, you can think of as quasi-abstract. Um, and now, I, I don't think I need, so the obligations and so on, nowadays we record them on paper, but in the olden days they were recorded in people's memory. Uh, now, a couple of years back, there was a man called Julian Cole, who was a professor in Buff State, professor of philosophy. And every year or so, he would come to UB and give a talk about the social construction of mathematics. And every year, I really attacked him. And he always came back for more. I now think he was right. <laughs> so it just shows. Um, so this is the, the, the first of a series of papers. Actually, I think there were two earlier ones. But this is, this is the first of a, a, a series of papers. So he, he, is, he, he is basically re, uh, recreating some of the things I said in the ontogenesis of mathematical objects paper, but doing it much better, much more sophisticatedly. He captures the creativity and the freedom of mathematics. The big problem is the authority. So how do you get authority for your mathematical discovery? And now, um, so which is the, the money uh, phrase in this? Uh, so, we have to authentic, uh, authenticate the ontological commitments of mathematical theories without curtailing mathematic, mathematicians' freedom to create, li, creatively introduce mathematical of, uh, ontology. I argue that these two constraints are best met by a mathematical, uh, a metaphysical interpretation of mathematics that makes, takes mathematical entities to be constitutively constructed. And by that, he doesn't mean much more than socially. And then in the next paper, he brings in the, the dimension of institutions, which is what I've been pointing to when I talk about social memory and uh, recordings which are developed over time and so forth. So notice he uses the freestanding term. And I'm not sure he got it for me, but it's nice that typically are introduced to serve representational functions. And, um, and now he's, he's describing this institutional reality and the meta-ontology, whatever that means, and arguing that the philosophy of mathematics that has as its central thesis, uh, a, a, sorry, its central tenet, this can account for the objectivity, necessity, and atemporality of mathematics. Now, these are the things which I was arguing with him about. I said you cannot ground the necessity of mathematical truths in a social construction account of the ways mathematical entities begin to exist. Because particularly if you take creativity and these other things into account, you can't creatively create a necessary truth. Now, I, well, I think what I would say now is that you can creatively constrain, uh, create a mathematical object and by you describe it in a certain way, it's the ratio of the circumference to a, of a circle to the diameter. And then you can infer necessary truths from your description, which is an axiom. That's what I would say now. All right, and then the third one is called social construction mathematics and the collective imposition of function onto reality. So he's really being surly in here, except he's following my freestanding correction of surly. Um, 
Stereotypes of social constructions suggest that the existence of social constructions is accidental and that such constructs have arbitrary and subjective features. Here I explore a conception and so on. Um, in particular, I argue that the collective imposition of function is typically non-accidental and the products of such imposition frequently have non-arbitrary and objective features. Now this is, I think, where he, he, uh, he addresses a really difficult point. So when we created pi, um, we, there were objective features of reality that we had to confront, namely circles. And we couldn't draw perfect circles, but we could draw very nearly perfect circles. And, um, and wh when we constructed pi, we were indeed bending to those necessary features of reality. But then the Platonists could say, aha, what you mean by pi is a necessary feature of reality, which was there already, because as we Platonists know, mathematical entities are atemporal. They, they're not created by people. So there's an issue here. How do we distinguish the mathematical entity? from the features of reality which have non-arbitrary and objective concern. And um, so that's, a, uh, that's an issue that uh, Jobs and I have to address also. All right, now, um, I, I, I won't talk about document acts. Uh, so Reiner has a, a, a very um, complicated ontology of social acts of which Speech acts, like promising, are one example, and of the parts of social acts, and of the um, of whether the underlying experiences, the underlying mental content, are states or processes, and um, whether they need to be addressed to other people, whether they need to be registered by their addressees. Um, the fa founding relations, so you can't marry somebody unless you have a certain authority. All of these are a priori truths. What they give rise to. So uh, a promise gives rise to a mutually correlated claim and obligation, for instance. And um, and then um, and then the entities which have to obtain in order for the, the the social acts to take place, such as relations of authority. That's an entity. And then other parts of social acts. So when you make a promise, there has to come into being a disposition on your part to realize the promise. Otherwise, you didn't make the promise. So the promise is necessarily dependent upon the disposition on the part of the promise. All of these are a priori laws. And, that, and you can present, represent them in diagrams. Um, and then there are, once you have these diagrams, you can see that there are modifications. So there are different kinds of sham promises, for instance and um, different kinds of collective social acts. And the modifications occur because some elements here are missing. So maybe that no one registers the promise, or it may be that there's no sincere attention, or it may be that no action follows. You never actually fulfill the promise, and so on. No trust, that's another dimension. And you can apply the whole thing, which is very similar to the case of commanding. The commanding is just switching the commander commandee relation so that it, it becomes a commandee commander relation. Uh, all right, now, the most important of all of these, all of these social acts, is the act of enactment. And um, if you have a dollar bill, I, anyway, if you have a pound note, British pound note, you'll see that there is a, a declaration from the bank, uh, the governor of the Bank of England, that he will pay the bearer of this pound note one pound. <laughs> uh, and then there's a signature underneath. Now, when when that signature was made, when the relevant act occurred, then the pound note came into existence, both that particular instance and the, the, the genre, the type of document. And it uh, came into existence through enactment. And this enactment had a mathematical dimension because a pound note was then, in the good old days, worth exactly 240 pence. And you could even make it worth 418 halfpennies, which is a half pence. Um, and that's important for some of the entities which 
are brought into being by Anachman, which are very important, particularly in the economic domain, namely that you can divide them mathematically into perfectly equal fractions. So, this is the first paragraph of the German Civil Code, which Reinach wrote a lot about. And it t tells us how a subject of rights begins to exist. But it doesn't tell us as a fact. It enacts a social fact. The social phenomenon of, of a, a, a thing that is subject to rights begins to exist at the completion of birth as a result of this enactment. So it makes the entity, namely an organism subject to rights. And that is the model for how mathematical entities come into existence. Uh, it's a matter of ena enactment. And, and here, the enactment is towards all the, all the subjects in the society, in Germany in this case. And in mathematics, the enactment would be to all the subjects engaged in a particular kind of mathematics, both present and future. All right, we don't need this. Now, when we think about enactments, then we realize that there are three sorts of history that an entity can have. So numbers, if you're a Platonist or a believer in chronica, uh, have a, an atemporal or, you, uh, um, what's the word? Omnitemporal existence. They exist all the time. They never change. They don't have any causal features at all. And, um, and then you have Bill Clinton, who's changing all the time. And that's true of all other organisms, buildings, everything in the real world of what happens and is the case. They're co subject to constant changes through time. And they have a beginning to exist in time, and he, even Bill, will die at some stage. And then 19 minutes or so later, he will cease to exist. Or maybe he'll have a bit of a longer time. But he will die. Um, at some time. But now Clinton's presidency is different from these. Clinton's presidency began to exist at a certain point in time. It existed and then it ceased to exist. And this is characteristic of the way in which entities which are inactive exist. They are part of history, but they do not change. They just come into existence, exist, and then go out of existence. Now, mathematical entities may never go out of existence, so they may just have this part. They, they, this goes on forever. But certainly, things like presidencies, obligations, debts, um, permissions, and the like, they have this shape. And all offices, being senator, being, uh, yes? Are universals like one? Yes. Well, so that some universals are like one. Are uh, universals dependent on their existence on the existence of these things? Yes. So I, I don't want to go into that story, although it would be a story that we have to go into in the ultimate statement of these things. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's a good question. That what, which means I don't have a good answer. I will have a good answer. All right, so in the first uh, group we have necessary objects, in the second group we have contingent objects in the, caught up in the world of causality, and in the third group we have objects which are intelligible but have a starting point in time. And um, uh, so the, 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 I think that Reinach deserves to be honored to a much greater degree than he is. Because I believe he was the first philosopher ever to recognize that there are objects of this kind. So Kant certainly didn't know about this. Plato didn't know about this. Um, the, the, uh, Ingarden uh, certainly developed it, but I'm pretty sure that was under the influence of his teacher, teacher Reinach. Um, and it's amazingly important because it applies to the whole realm of the law and the whole realm of economics and many other parts, and the whole realm of um, uh, many other parts of everyday life, such as the whole realm of speeches. But people just didn't notice. Um, still, very few people know how important I am. All right, now, um, it applies also to chess. Chess, is, chess and game generally are another area where we find 
entities of this third kind. So the chess game was invented, it started to exist, and it, it, it has changed in small ways, but still uh, not, in, not in, in ways which disturb the basic picture. So, many of these abstract entities or historico-cultural entities, these quasi-abstract entities of the third kind, have quasi-mathematical properties, and that's important. So, and that, that's, that these are some examples. Though your social security number is not a number. It doesn't have prime factors or anything. It's a social object. And you can't burn it, you can't bend it. It, 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 only, it can only be created by a certain process. And it can only be eliminated by a certain process. Um, all right, let me go and talk about that. So, so had all the wrong views about money. All right, so I believe that Reinhardt's a priori theory of law is a very good approximation to the underlying ontology of the Austrian School of Economics. And uh, so where Reinhardt was talking about the micro-institutions um, of human life and, and indeed the, the, the meso-institutions of legal uh, affairs, the Austrian school are talking about the microeconomic realm. And um, so these are other areas where the Munich approach to, to doing ontology could, in principle, be applied. And in some of them, so the colorology and tone theory have been applied uh, to, that they've been developed by, in ways which are uh, similar to the way the uh, Munich phenomenologists worked. And all of these have been developed by Munich phenomenologists. And um, uh, so now the Reiner points out that while there are some relations and some essences or a priori structures which are subject to a priori laws, there are others which are purely conventional. In other words, they you add conventions. So an example would be an endowment mortgage or derivatives created by it by some formula on the stock market or a football team manager. So that there's no, there are no a priori laws governing football team manager in the way that there are governing pi. Um, but now what is involved in each of these is always, at the, they always have a grounding in a priori social institutions. So a manager is, the idea of a manager, or the essence manager, is grounded in the fact one person has authority over other persons. And um, a, uh, an endowment mortgage is grounded in the fact that one person can loan uh, money to another person. And so what we have here are institutional modifications of a priori institutions, or a priori institutional essences. And another example would be, uh, uh, let's suppose that it's true in New York State that a miner cannot sign a contract and be um, liable for what the contract states that the miner has to supply. This would mean that a contract signed by a miner is not valid. That is not an a priori institutional um, entity. It's a modification. So this modification that if you are less than 13, you can't sign a contract, is a product of positive law, not a product of a priori law. And, and Reiner was uh, writing about a priori law, but also about the ways in which a priori law is used as a grounding for positive law, where lawyers and politicians make uh, arbitrary, more or less arbitrary changes to what should obtain in an a priori way of the underlying and you can see how we're going to have similar modifications in the realm of mathematics. All right, now let me uh, let me try and move quickly to get to my. Um, um, I'll put this slide on the on the wiki page. All right, so the idea is we have a history of mathematics and a history of physics, and physics is constantly feeding into the history of mathematics to yield new problems. Issues. Mathematics grows. There will be some offshoots where mathematicians grow new kinds of, of creatures 
which are not addressing specific needs of physicists or engineers at a given time, but they may later prove to be useful. That's a very common phenomenon that mathematicians are doing something crazy, uh, that they are doing it for the sake of the beauty of the, of the entity that they're, they're building, but it turns out to have an application in the next generation. And uh, this is uh, something of an illustration of that. Um, but I found this, and as you know, I like diagrams, uh, in the Wikipedia article on mathematical physics. And of course, I like it because it contains the word ontology. Now, interestingly, uh, the Wikipedia article doesn't mention the word ontology at all, so I have no idea what they meant. Um, they just have the diagram. Uh, but there are some things which explain what this means. So we have math, mathematics, mathematical physics, ontology and physics, and in some way we get physics by taking mathematical physics and taking ontology and smushing them together. And, uh, and mathematics is somehow in feeding into both of those. And I understand, I understand how mathematics is feeding into mathematical physics, I don't understand what they might mean by this arrow, but we've got three out of four. So. <laughs> Mathematical physics is an approach to physics which emphasizes mathematical reason. That's what they say. Theoretical physics is an approach to physics that emphasizes observations and experiments. And so we're interested in mathematical physics, which is looking at physics as a... a, 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 a um, a, stru a structure or a, an endeavor which is aiming to utilize the rigor that you find in mathematics. And I could simplify that by saying it's going to be using these mathematical structures which the mathematicians are inventing. So mathematical physics is use, import, use, application, testing of mathematical structures to physical phenomena, trying to find which mathematical structure fits a given physical phenomenon. And now we can understand the diagram as follows. So you start historically with a piece of mathematics, and this might be a, a model of mathematics, which is a model of periodic motion with constant amplitude, which you can define in purely mathematical terms. And then you add ontology, and I'm going to take that to mean you add reference to a specific system, in this case, the harmonic oscillator, and specific magnitudes such as force and, and so forth, and, and um, amplitude. Um, and when you add ontology to the mathematics, where the ontology includes pieces of the physics ontology, then you get physics. So, and uh, that's just a complicated way of saying that physics is the application of mathematics to real world phenomena like oscillators. So we finished exactly on time by my watch. Uh, are there any questions?